folks, it's Jeff here. Just a quick reminder, if you're loving Disney Coast to Coast, there are a couple of easy ways that you can support the show. We'd love it if you could rate and review us on iTunes or wherever you listen to the show. This is a simple way to help other Disney fans find us. Also, go ahead and share your favorite episodes on social media and be sure to tag us. You can find all of our social media information at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. And finally, I just want to say thank you to all of you who listen every week. Your support is very appreciated, and we love that you're enjoying our Disney geekiness. Now on with the show. Get ready for your weekly dose of pixie dust with Disney Coast to Coast. Hey folks, and welcome to Disney Coast to Coast, the ultimate unofficial Disney fan podcast. I'm Jeff DePauly, and today on the show, I have guest Nick Gregory joining me, who is a background artist for the Walt Disney Company, but his history and his path of getting there isn't quite what you would expect, so let's jump to that conversation right now. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you very much, Jeff. Nice you, to be here. You uh, contacted me because you listen to Disney Coast to Coast. Yes, I do. I listen to a lot of Disney podcasts while I work. Yeah, which yeah. Well, that's like the coolest to think of as a podcaster. I'm like, okay, yeah. this stuff that I'm talking about and somebody who's creating that stuff is listening while creating. Like, awesome. Okay. Yeah, no, I get that. That's cool. I like it. <laughs> that's a cool compliment. So we're just going to have a little discussion about your career. And it's. I will preface this with a lot of this is going to seem like, what does this have to do with Disney? And I will say, <laughs> we're getting there. That's what I will say for now. But it's kind of mind-blowing, based on the accent, you're from Australia. That's correct, yes. And I just love the story, because you had a dream of working in animation, and and moved out here, uh, how many years ago? Uh, it'll be four years in October. Wow, that's incredible. It's only been four years, and yeah. you've already accomplished so much. And it flew by. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure, yes, it does, certainly. But uh, before that leap of faith, you were actually, I love this, a professional wrestler. I was, yes. That's usually the first thing everyone brings up. <laughs> uh, I, I mean, to the point that you had, you, you're an action figure. Yeah. <laughs> and my wife too. We have them at home on the. On the on oh, is she the, a wrestler as well? She was. That's how oh, I met her. Yeah. That's amazing. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, was that kind of passion number one for you, wrestling? No, actually, the art has always been first. Even since I was a kid, it was the thing I was drawn to most. And it's thanks to animation. Everything animation Disney, Warner Brothers, all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Um,. So the wrestling was just that thing where I followed it too, because it's kind of like watching cartoons, especially when I was a kid. And like Hulk Hogan, Ultimate Warrior, they were all doing their thing. Um, were you an Undertaker fan? Oh, yeah. Because he's, he's, I'm not really into <laughs> wrestling, but there was probably a three or four year period when I was like that age that is, you know, wrestling's made for like uh -huh. 12, 13, 14. Yeah. And I was obsessed with The Undertaker, just like being a fan of horror in general. Yep. I, uh, it's so funny because my mom will always say to me, when did you become such a horror fan? Because like uh -huh. these days I'm really into it. And I'm like, think of my childhood. With monster trucks, it was Gravedigger. Yeah. <laughs> and with wrestling, it was Undertaker. Yeah, so. exactly. And he was so popular. Everyone loved him. Oh. I, I still love him. He wrestles like once a year still, but he's great. Yeah, I love him. So in any case, so you, you became passionate about wrestling and yep. somehow... I mean, how do you become a professional wrestler? It's it's a weird thing. I didn't think it was possible in Australia. Uh -huh. So when I saw my first live show, it was like the first time I watched animation. Okay. And I was like, here's my chance to be part of something that seems surreal and that no one can do, uh -huh. um, which is what most people think. And then I turn up to the sh another show and I ask, how do you guys do this? And they just go, we go to training school. It's an hour away. And that was it. I was hooked. I was like, okay, I'm doing it. And I, I walk into my first uh, training session and there's like 50 guys in there and they all freeze and look over at me and I just start dripping sweat <laughs> because I'm like, this is the most nerve wracking thing ever. Uh, and I still did it. I just walked in there and started like taking bumps and hits and uh, it took me four months. I picked it up quick and then I had my first professional show. And w so you were like... You had a whole character and everything. Yeah. Um, so once, is, that, is that called? Is that competitive wrestling, or what do they call that? I mean, I think when I grew up, it was the amateur wrestling. Okay. Is what they called the Olympic wrestling. Okay. The, the Greco-Roman type stuff. So that's more of the competitive one. But I, all I ever heard was 
the wrestling I liked was called professional wrestling, which it should be the other way around, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Um, it's, it's more of the show, you know, like, like The Rock and Hulk Hogan, all those guys. Um, but I loved it. And yeah, I got in there and after four months of training, I, I got to pick my character. And that was the best thing ever because <laughs> it was like I was turning myself into an animated character or a comic book superhero. I love this. Yeah. And, and you know that um, the scene in Spider-Man where I think the first film where he's drawing his outfit um, and coming up with how he's going to look. Yeah. I did that. I'm in my bedroom and I'm drawing these things. And, it, and that was like the same year or like a year after that came out. And I'm sitting there going, this is surreal. I'm doing what a superhero did in the film. And yeah, I designed like masks and costumes and, and then I got to be a character finally. And That's so amazing. <laughs> yeah, it's surreal. It really is. And your name was Nick XL, XL right? XL spelt like uh, extra large. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I still don't know why I chose that. And my, my character wasn't the greatest. It was just, I was always the bad guy. Uh -huh. So it was just a, a mean street thug of a guy that would come in and like get his butt handed to him really that's it yeah um the, the good guys would get over and, and i'd make sure they look good so and <laughs> the question i think anybody who ever watched wrestling at any <clears throat> point in their life is always oh what's it like backstage these guys who hate each other like do they hang out after so what what's it like backstage what's <laughs> going a, on you're the first person that's ever asked that no actually. that's a lie no I true i think Are because you most me? people don't a lot of people don't ask about what happens behind the scenes i think because it's so amazing and in your face uh -huh. there's always questions about in the ring um but it's it's super nice and I'd, I'd compare it to like a carnival or a circus okay everyone is a team yeah and the toughest man in the ring that you'll see in that show is usually the quietest and the nicest person yeah and it, it's so weird we're, we're all handshaking and then you get out there and there's a switch and the worst people in the world out in the ring can just bring it on like that, but they're yeah. the nicest backstage. I think it's just a release. I think, yes, honestly, I, at least for me, like uh, for me, it goes back to horror stuff. But I know, like when I think of myself as in general a pretty nice guy, but like when I get into a horror thing, if I'm working a haunt event or something, it's just I want to murder you, and it's like <laughs> so much fun to let that out. So. Yeah, that's what I felt like every weekend. I, I would work at the time I was doing um, graphic design uh -huh. and I was producing hip hop music. Wow, <clears throat> another weird thing. And then on the weekend, if I had a, a bad week or my boss picked on me or something, yep. then it all comes out in the ring. That's and, fantastic. And then you can, because I was a bad guy, it was even better because I could yell at the fans. I could say whatever I wanted. Um, and it was so cathartic. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. Yeah. So have you ever heard the rumors that, you know, I don't think this is coming to fruition by any mm -hmm. means, but have you heard the rumors that Disney was actually considering buying the WWE? No. That, that was... Uh, you know, it's kind of the way Disney works these days. Is they, you know, they buy Marvel, yeah. they buy the Muppets, they buy Fox, they buy who else? Everything. Yeah. Uh, it's Lucasfilm. And so there was, you know, discussion out there that Disney was looking into buying the WWE. And you being a Disney fan, I'm curious your thoughts on that and a wrestling fan. What are your thoughts on that? Oh, that's that's weird. I, I like it in the fact that Disney is all about entertainment uh -huh. and, and so is the WWE. But I feel like they would turn those characters into even more things. <laughs> Can you, would, you imagine <laughs> meeting wrestlers in the parks like for photo meet and greets? Oh, that'd be dangerous. <laughs> they would not be able to contain themselves. Yeah. Maybe that's why they don't do it. That's so fun. Although, getting, I mean, they're casting The Rock in, you know, the Jungle Cruise movie and oh, stuff. Yeah, so, they are. so it's getting, although, does he prefer to be called Dwayne Johnson these days? I'm not sure. I think he's transitioning to, to Dwayne, okay. but I'll never not call him The Rock. Yeah, Dwayne The Rock Johnson. Yes. <laughs> but, uh, so, okay, so you go from wrestling to we're still not getting to animation because, as you mentioned, there's this whole music career that you had. Mm -hmm. And how did that come about? Was that after wrestling? Was it all kind of happening at the same time? Uh, it, it was overlapping. So okay. the hip-hop music started when I was, like, 17. And it's just something I enjoyed because the neighborhood I was in, I saw those same stories uh, that I heard in hip-hop music. And everybody listened to it, so I just I cottoned on and did the same thing. And... Uh, before you knew it, I was making it in my bedroom and then recorded in a studio. And after about eight years, I was touring, um, had stuff on radio and everything. And it was a big achievement for me. I got to perform with like childhood heroes and um, and that overlapped the wrestling by about four years. So the hip hop was first, then the wrestling, then the, the art after that. Wow. Animation. Yeah. And between the music and the animation, you also have four gaming world records. <laughs> 
<laughs> what is this? Good research. Um, <laughs> I don't know what it is about me, but I'm very driven. And if I if I get up and I see like a TV show or read a magazine and something interests me, mm-hmm. I'm like, I have to do it. So one day I'm watching the Guinness uh, World Records TV show. Yeah. And at the end of it, and my wife hates this, I just stood up and I'm like, I want a world record. <laughs> And she's like, no, you don't. <laughs> I was like, no, I really do. So I picked a couple of things and I um, emailed and sent letters and stuff back when internet wasn't really a thing. And I got all these replies saying, no, you can't do this. You can't do this. And then finally I found one that was a strong man record where you had to hold, like hold weights for a long period of time out okay. of the side. And that's was, the one you chose. Yeah, I know. It was crazy. Oh, um, and it really hurt my shoulders and everything. And I came close. It was seven seconds off this record. Oh. And then finally I had to give up because I was getting injured. And then I found out you could do uh, video game stuff because they just released the video game version of the World Records book. So I found that. I found a game that I could uh, get a record in and I just thought, I'm going to try it. I want a world record. I want that certificate on my wall. Unbelievable. And you got four of them? Well, it's in one. So it's in the Guinness World Records Nintendo Wii game. Okay. And there's little mini games. Okay. So you can set the record in like, I think there might be 20 or 30 games. So I got four of those in there. And it's just like time-based things and stuff like that. That's unbelievable. (laughs) That's crazy. Okay. So all of that happens. And since the beginning, you've had this passion for animation Mm -hmm. and art. And you decide one day, I'm going to leave all that behind, move to America and make this dream of art and animation come true. Yeah. Okay. So, I guess let's start with how difficult was it to leave the wrestling behind, leave the hip-hop, leave (laughs) the gaming? (laughs) Uh, You know, how, how, how much did you struggle with that? I mean, that's, those are... I'm not going to count the gaming. Those are yeah. two s- serious passions that you put a lot yeah. of time into that you ultimately decided, you know what, this is more important. Yeah. Uh, it, that was difficult, really difficult, because wrestling became my life. Mm-hmm. And if you've ever seen the Mickey Rourke movie, The Wrestler. I didn't see it, but I know what you're talking about. Check that out. Um, what happens to him in there, it's not my story, but that's a common story where people can't give it up even when they're in a bad way. Mm. And that's how I kind of was. My body was hurting. I had a lot of injuries, um, but I still couldn't do it. So even though that was happening um, and then the hip hop was like doing okay as well, I could have pushed that harder. There's this thing in the back of my mind that's going, everything you do is creative. Mm -hmm. I'm still entering art competitions. I'm still drawing all the time. Um, And I've been doing that since I was like three years old. And I thought, finally, I've got to do it. Yeah. Um, I'm getting old. My body's giving up in the wrestling. And I thought, how long can I do the music for? And I thought, no, this is the the dream I've had. And the f- the thing that keeps popping up in my mind is I treated it like a superpower. Mm-hmm. Animation was a superpower to me. So I knew that was almost impossible to get in Australia. Um, and my wife was supportive. And she said, all right, start studying. Um, give it five to ten years. Mm-hmm. And then see where you can get. <clears throat> and then I'm stubborn. So in the back of my mind, I'm like, it'll be two to three. And then two years later, I got lucky and I won a visa diversity lottery um, thing. Have okay. you heard of this before? No. It, I just, know it's very difficult to come to this country if, yeah. if, if you don't live here. And I've heard a lot of stories from a lot of people. And yeah. Um, grateful to have been born here. Uh, yeah, it's hard. And I, I applied for jobs for like two or three years as I'm studying to get better as an artist. Uh, But finally, I heard about this. A wrestling friend had won the diversity lottery visa so he could come here and compete. And I thought, okay, that's a thing. I've got to try it at least. I'm not going to win, but I might as well try. And first year I won. Wow. Through through wrestling? Well, uh, you just – well, I heard about it through a wrestler. Um, But then you just apply through a government website here in America. And it's once a year in like October. And like I said, I didn't think I'd win. Uh, I got it. And when we found out, my wife and I, it was the most shocking thing in my life. Like I thought, everything changes today. Yeah. And then we second guessed it for like maybe three seconds. We're like, do we do this? And then straight away, she's like, "Uh, yep. And she's so supportive, my wife. Um, So how do you win that? Like, It it literally is a lottery. Oh, okay. You put your name in. Okay. And they just want a certain amount of diversity here in America. Gotcha. Um, which I think is an amazing thing. There's no other country doing that. And the countries that are least represented get more chances. Okay. So I think African nations get a lot more. Australia is pretty slim, um, but there, there was enough there to, for me to think I have a chance. Yeah. And yeah, they just pick, pick your name out of a hat and you, you get in. That's it. Interesting. Yeah. So 
what was the first animated thing you remember seeing? I'm going to assume a very young age. Yeah. But what was the first thing you can remember that you're like, that's what I want to do? Okay. The, there's two things. The one that I, I know that thing happened where my brain clicked over and I was like, yep, this is it. Mm-hmm was Fantasia. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. Um, I don't remember the age. I think I might have been 10 or 11 for this one. Seeing a VHS or was it a re-release in I think theaters? VHS. Yeah. yeah. And I watched that and I'm, I think two weeks before that, my grandmother took me to an art gallery. Okay. So, that affected me and I was like, this is cool. Mm-hmm. But when I saw that, I was like, art just came to life and it was magic. Yeah. Like, literally, I thought magic was happening on a screen, hence why I think it's still a superpower to be in animation. Yeah. Um, and I was hooked. Like, art was moving. It wasn't just about characters. It wasn't telling silly stories. It was just art, and it, and it was alive. And, and I was hooked forever. Um, and a little before that, I definitely was into the Looney Tunes. I think Nickelodeon cartoons started getting big in Australia. Nickelodeon is, uh, you know, it's so funny. I do voiceover, and yeah. I often say, like, you know, obviously it would be a dream gig to do a voice on a Disney Channel show or something. Uh-huh. But I'll tell you, there's a part of me that really wants that Nickelodeon <laughs> gig. I definitely grew up, like, Disney was always, like, a major, major influence for me. Yeah. But as far as the channel is concerned, I grew up much more Nickelodeon kid than a Disney Channel kid. Because Disney Channel, yeah. when I was a kid, you had to pay for. So, okay. we only got it when we were stealing it <laughs> when they gave those free trials yeah. and stuff. So. I, you know, I grew up with Rugrats and Doug and all yeah. that stuff. Yeah, me too. And, and that's, it is funny because it's like Nickelodeon's now down the street from where we're recording this, yeah, you know, from so where weird I live. To me. <laughs> and it's, it's, I drive by there and I'm like, oh, one of these days, uh-huh. a voice in one of those would be spectacular. Yeah. But so, so Fantasia, major influence, that's pretty cool. Now, these days, what you've done for Disney is primarily as a background artist, correct? Yeah, background painter. Okay. So, I want you to talk a little bit about a background painter. I mean, Mm -hmm. obviously, just the name of it, people know what it is. It's the background. But I feel like it's often forgotten, right? Because we're looking at the animated character or whatever. Uh So, tell us a little bit about that skill, that art, what goes into a background painter. Okay. So, essentially... And for the work I've done for Disney, it's it's with the publishing department. Mm-hmm. But essentially, it's still the same as animation, uh, same pipeline. So, after the designers have done, uh, say, the storyboard and then design characters and the actual environment, mm-hmm. the artwork then goes to the background painter. And that's where I come in. So, it, it's, it sounds like it's a glorified coloring in book type job. Mm-hmm. Um, but you have to then get the style. You do the lighting. Uh, It's fairly important. And for me, I just do backgrounds and then someone else also paints the characters. Mm -hmm. Um, And there's a lot of steps in the process. And that's something that when I tell people, they're always shocked. They just think someone must illustrate the book. Uh, But it's just like animation. There is a complete pipeline. And even myself, I was naive to that uh, no more than a few years ago, like Mm -hmm. how many processes there were through that. So, yeah, I I come in and, and, and match a style. So it could be Sleeping Beauty. Uh, Beauty and the Beast and multiple artists in all those departments work on every book and and sometimes the same thing in animation. So, who's setting the style? Is it the, the, I guess, the design of the character sets the, or I guess, who's who's setting that style? If it's a new book or they're transitioning like an old story, let's say it's Beauty and the Beast and they want a different look for it, um, a concept artist will get that at the start. Probably someone in house at Disney Mm -hmm. has that job and they'll come up with a new style or a new look. But for most of the stuff I've been lucky enough to work on, it has been similar to the film. So, I'll actually get reference or get to see stuff from the archives. Do you get to go to the morgue and look at all that stuff? I've seen them, yes. And I had to reference... uh, My first book was Sleeping Beauty. So, I got to see the Ivendell artwork. Wow. And I got reference of that. And it's stunning. I was salivating. (laughs) Well, it's funny that you mention uh, Ivendell and, and Sleeping Beauty because when I think background artist... That is the first Disney film I think of yeah. because it has such a specific style to it. Yeah. It's certainly Sleeping Beauty by no means is even close to my favorite Disney animated film. But when you say background artist, it's the first one I immediately think of. Yeah, I have two simultaneously pop in my head and that's also the, the first one. Mm-hmm. And like you said, it's not for me too. It's not my favorite. It may not even be in like top five or ten. Yeah. But I still think it's probably one of the most stunning films ever made there's something about the square 
bushes and trees and stuff yeah. surrounding the castle that i don't know there's just something so whimsical and cool about it and yeah. i love that they've recreated that in real life in the parks you know like yeah, they I took know. that style of the background you're like well if they're square in the movie they're gonna be square in the park you know yeah. i think that that's so cool especially in paris i feel like they've really oh, i can't done wait to that. go there that looks oh, good it's that castle is my favorite castle yeah it's so stunningly beautiful but um so what was the other one you said the sleeping beauty is one you think of and uh the other one is bambi because okay. of tyrus wong okay yeah um and he's my favorite artist and that was much more realism right it, it was realism and it was simplicity. Yeah. So it was it was very subtle touches of light and then everything else was kind of suggested. And that to me is genius. Okay. Yeah. And um, so, so you said you did Disney publishing mostly. What else mm-hmm. have you done besides the Sleeping Beauty book? Uh, I've worked on, I'll try to think of the ones I can say. I've worked on Beauty and the Beast. So you're working on some right now that you can't announce? Yeah, every, every year I've been here, I've worked on it, and I hope to continue that every year. Okay. Um, so yeah, the first one is Sleeping Beauty, uh, Beauty and the Beast, Brave. Uh, there's another Sleeping Beauty, which I can say comes out uh, start of October. Okay. Um, I think that's all I can say. <laughs> How did you first get in with the Walt Disney Company? That's that's a really weird story. So I'm always telling people I, I would expect <laughs> nothing less <Yeah>. of you. <laughs> so I'm always telling people to to get out and most people call it network. I just say just get out and do stuff. Yeah. In the world, especially here in LA. So I told one of my friends who wanted to invite Floyd Norman mm-hmm. out to uh, her birthday party. And Lauren goes, Well that's that's a bit nerve wracking and I'm like, just do it anyway. What's yeah. the worst he's gonna say? No. She did and he said yes. Yeah. So now it's it's a small group of people in the Tam O'Shanter in Glendale. Oh yeah, of course. The yeah. Tam O'Shanter, if the listeners don't know, is a favorite stop of Walt and his Imagineers back when he was working on the Hyperion studio, which yes. was right down the street from the Tam O'Shanter. I went there this past April for the first time. Oh really? And, yeah. You yeah. like it? Yeah, it's pretty cool. It's nice. It's yeah. a nice little place. So yeah, we, we were sitting in there um, and there's Floyd across from me and I know who he is and I haven't really interacted before this, like a handshake or two maybe. But his wife, Adrian Brown Norman, works for Disney Publishing. Yes, yes. Yeah. So she starts mentioning some names, and I'm like, oh, they're my friends. And she goes, well, give me a business card if you're an artist too, and maybe I'll contact you. And I thought nothing of it. We, we shared a scotch. We had a, a, a good time there, and they're great people. Next morning, I get an email and says, do you want to work on something? And it took me like three, four hours to reply because I kept going back to reread the email going, this isn't happening. <laughs> this doesn't happen. Yeah, yeah. Not that quickly. And yeah, that, that was it. It was just test on test on it and do like a, a copy of our style. Uh-huh. That, that was for a Beauty and the Beast book. Um, I was a little rough, I have to admit, the first go, but she believed in me and, and that's nice of her. And I got another shot and I, I nailed it. And then I've been doing stuff every year since. So, these books that come out, these are children's storybooks. They're picture books Mm -hmm. for the most part. Yeah. How many artists are there working on something like that? Like, is there one background artist? No, somebody's drawing it. You say you're you're putting in the color. Yeah. But are you the only one putting color in the background? No. Every book I've been on so far, I I get more of, like, more opportunity to do more each time. Uh Uh-huh. But I would say there might be two to three people in each position every book that's crazy it's a big team like that's a i mean to think of a little children's book yep (laughs) that is such a and i would think in some cases of like you know some someone who's not disney creating a book Mm -hmm. it's probably one person doing it all you know well i've done that myself i made my own book i had to do everything and that's and that's yeah it's mind-boggling that there's so many hands touching one little project and i feel like maybe the because all the other divisions do it that way, that's obviously influenced them, and it, and it yeah. runs well and it's smoothly, and yeah. so yeah, it works. Now, when you're working on something, are you going to the studio and working on it, or are you working on it from home? Um, mostly from home. Uh, a lot of the artists do. Uh-huh. Uh, it'd be great to work in there full time. Everyone wants that, um, but I get to go in there occasionally, and I, p- I pick up work and get revisions. Um, so when it's the season between like November and middle of the following year, um, I look forward to that. Maybe once a month, mm-hmm. I go in and. And just check how it is, have lunch there. That's cool. So, yeah, it is good. That's a lot of fun. Now, I also saw something about a Peter Pan grandfather clock on your portfolio. Oh, yeah. What was? How that. did that come about? Um, and what exactly was it? Was this like a full-size 
grandfather clock? It, it wasn't full size. It would be about three, three and a half foot tall. Okay. But it was for the Disney, I think it was Disney Peter Pan. Oh, sorry. It was called Project Neverland. And it was the uh, anniversary of the Peter Pan uh, animated film. Mm-hmm. And they had it at the CSG Gallery in Burbank. And just a bunch of artists that work for Disney and a lot of up-and-coming artists had a chance to exhibit there. And I thought, I'm going to be different. Every time I do a gallery, I want something that people go, I didn't expect to see that. Yeah. So I thought, well, I'm going to try something physical rather than 2D flat mm-hmm. stuff. And I don't know why I picked a grandfather clock. I guess the idea of the crocodile. Like, the crocodile, the yeah. yeah. And then I made it happen. I got it like this thing laser cut. I designed it, painted it, made the mechanics, animatronics in it, everything, lighting. Um, took it to the show and, and people loved it. I even got a photo next to the original Tinkerbell. Oh, cool. Margaret, Margaret Carey, Carey yeah. Yep. Right, right next to my artwork. And that was a pretty cool event. That's awesome. Now, what is your, all, if you could have any gig at Disney, mm-hmm. what is it that you, do you want to design character or? Uh, for me, because I've seen some of your character designs for other companies. Yeah. Um, you work for, can I say who you work for? Yeah, you can. You yeah. work for Thinkwell. I do, yes. Who does a lot of um, themed entertainment designs and yes. stuff. Uh, they, they work with like museums and theme parks and, and even have just made their own theme park as well. Oh, which with, theme park did they make? They built entirely the Warner Brothers World theme park in Abu Dhabi. Oh, I didn't realize that was Thinkwell. Okay. Yeah, the whole thing took them 10 years and it's amazing. Did you work on that? I did, yes. I want to go to see that. I uh, have to see that. Yeah. Okay, I was going to say, did you go? No. You no I haven't been. gone. A lot of people did, but they were there many years before me. Yeah. Um, I will go there hopefully in the next year. I'm a little baffled as to why they haven't done it in the States. And mm-hmm. on top of that, if they did do it in the States, I would just be saying to myself, why did you sell the rights to Harry Potter? Not that, I'm, <laughs> trust me, I'm very happy that Universal has those rights. They're doing fantastic stuff with it. Yeah. But I would just think if there's a Harry Potter world, I mean, a, a yeah. Warner Brothers world, I would think Harry Potter should be there. But maybe that's a reason why they haven't yet. That's yeah. such a big IP yeah. to have not have on their list here. Yeah. And yeah. it's not in Abu Dhabi at all, right? Like it's uh, it's no. mostly DC comics and the Flintstones, yeah. which I'm so thrilled. Yeah, I know. They're still alive. I, I I love the Flintstones. That's like my favorite Hanna Barbera. Yeah. Um and you should check out the uh, video and people listening, check out the video of Warner Brothers World. Uh, that ride is incredible. You're going through Bedrock. Really? And, yeah. Oh, it's so nice. Yeah, I haven't done much research on it. I knew that it opened, and that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so Thinkwell does a lot of theme park stuff. Um, nothing for Disney, right? I know they may have done some stuff in the past. Um, like a few companies, they get picked up to help projects run along. Okay. But I'm not sure exactly what. I okay. can't say. Yeah. Uh, so you're doing you're doing the Thinkwell thing. You're doing the background art thing. Mm-hmm. What would be the ultimate goal for you? The ultimate job for me, I would love to be a background painter or color stylist for Disney TV. Oh, okay. But the ultimate is visual development artist Disney feature. Okay, so explain what that is. Yeah. So the Viz Dev team would just do... It's exactly what it sounds like. You're developing the visuals for the style of the movie, how it will look, concept art to sell the story to the the teams there, uh... You might help develop the look of the cloth that goes on their clothing. Like, every person has a specific uh, specialty. Does it include character design? Oh, yeah. Okay. So, I mean, I think maybe now they've transitioned the character team out of that, possibly. Mm-hmm. But it's there's still a, a close-knit team that whatever your specialty is, you're developing characters or you're doing environments. So, for me, my role would be in that team uh, doing concept art and backgrounds, like environment design. Okay. Yeah. Uh, as I was saying before, which got me to the Thinkwell thing, I've seen some of your character designs and they're fantastic on Thank your you. website. I'll mention the website now, nickgregory.com. Nick is just N-I-C. That's it. Gregory, as it sounds, dot com. So make sure you go check that out. So we, you started with um, the background work for Disney in how many years ago? Was it three, uh, three years ago at this Three point? years, yeah. Okay. Has the uh, way that you work changed at all as far as the tools that you use? Yes. So I'm mostly trained traditionally and my meaning my paintbrush, paint brush, pencils, yeah. yeah. Um and then you're sketching and I and I like using soft pastel. So I'm used to those things. Um coming here to America I had to start to relearn how to do digital art again. Hadn't touched it in years. So every book I get to do for them, 
uh, Adrian will give me a new process or she'll tell me to try a brush this way or use a certain technique in Photoshop on, on the computer. Um, so yeah, every single time I'm learning a new way to, to build a different designed book, mm -hmm. but it's always digital. Uh, unfortunately, we don't get to do traditional. No one really does anywhere anymore, yeah. unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I learn a lot. Like the first one I felt was very painterly. Uh, eventually I got to the Sleeping Beauty Ivan Earl style mm -hmm. where it's, it's meticulous detail and you have to use brushes that are very much like the real thing. Mm -hmm. So that, that was fun. It changes for every book, though. I have to kind of relearn something. Well, I know the technology changes like crazy over at Disney because I, you know, I had a friend who worked in a, a full time. There's a full time department at Disney where all that they're doing is trying to develop new tools yeah. to make life easier for the artists. Mm -hmm. So if that's a full time job, that means every project that comes along, there's some new tool and new toy that you guys are getting to play with. Oh yeah, and. I'm curious, you know, so much is done on a computer these days. Do you miss just the hand sketch stuff or do you do that on your own just to keep that practice up? I, I still do that myself yeah. and I have to because that's my favorite thing in the world. Uh, my wife hates it, but I love getting messy. Why does she hate it? No, she hates the fact that I mess the house up. Ah, I gotcha. <laughs> okay. Because uh, I use soft pastel, that mm -hmm. stuff is deadly. <laughs> and if I use too much of it, it's like a cloud of color through the house. Yeah. And I have ruined a house previously back home. Uh, I did uh, like a red painting with pastel and it went through the air conditioning system. Oh no. Yeah, it was bad. <laughs> <laughs> I remember once in college I was sculpting something out of styrofoam. Oh yeah. And I did it in my dorm room. <laughs> <laughs> bad idea. There was a lot of styrofoam. Ever. Like literally I was shaving it down uh -huh. and it was just, it was a mess. See, I, I know that's a problem and I still did that to myself <laughs> last year. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you got to do what you got to do for the art, right? Mm -hmm. Like that's, that's just crazy to me. I know that you've also been involved with the Walt Disney family. Family Museum yeah. in San Francisco, which is a fantastic uh, museum in space. Uh, how did you get involved there and what do you do? Uh, that again was just this lucky uh, like events that happened from that first meeting with Adrian and Floyd, where because I got to work on Sleeping Beauty and had been released, uh, people went to the Creative Talent Network Expo in Burbank that happens every oh, yeah. year. Mm -hmm. And they heard that I'd worked on Sleeping Beauty. And then they told me they're doing an Ivendell exhibit, which I think was a year or a year and a half ago that that happened. And they said, well, let's tie it into what you've done into our gallery showing and come up and do something. You can show your work, maybe teach something. And I'd just gotten, I think, to a good level in my plain air painting, mm -hmm. painting landscapes. And I said, well, why don't I teach a class in that? And that's something that Ivendell also did. Uh, he, he did a lot of plain air. So they got me up there and... I taught a class to a bunch of teachers from around the city. Wow. That, yeah, that's intimidating. <laughs> and I'd never taught a class before. Uh, wrestling, maybe, but not. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, they, they just they tied it into that exhibit, too. So I felt like crying the day I walked up there because I'm showing Sleeping Beauty artwork. I'm teaching. And then they do a tour of his artwork with the whole group and myself. And I'm like, I'm part of this. I'm yeah. part of this event. And this is part of history now. And uh, yeah, it's still surreal that I got to do that. Hmm, that's that's really crazy. And you teach classes uh, on your own now as well, or uh, yeah, I've done another one here in in LA, uh -huh. uh, and it was the same similar thing, just basic plain air painting, okay. and anyone can take that. It's like a, a beginner's level. What are the tools you use with that? Uh, that usually it's just one or two paint brushes. I try to keep everything pretty basic, and gouache paint. It's okay. kind of like acrylic, uh, easy to mix, easy to carry around and travel with, and just teach people how to to block in simple shapes and enjoy painting. And this is a great city for it too. Unfortunately, it's great because of the smog. Yeah. <laughs> I'm always curious when I talk to painters, this is a ridiculous question, but yeah. did you ever uh, <laughs> watch or practice the Bob Ross style of painting? <laughs> I have seen it, yes. And no, I never practiced it. <laughs> what do you think of it? Because I gotta uh, tell you, to me, it's like, meditation watching him paint it is i think they have it on netflix now or at least on youtube yeah, or something i think it's on netflix right yeah and it's just like is that good painting i don't even know the final result always looks good but i'm yeah. like i don't think this is like 
painting. I, I okay. I thought the same thing when I was younger. Um, I, I don't know if I class it as like the best thing ever. Yeah. But for someone that paints that quickly and has a decent effect in the end, yeah, I'll give I'll give him credit. Yeah, he can take some. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what a ridiculous question. Uh, so. You know, if people want to skip the wrestling part and the hip hop music part, mm -hmm. and they want to do what you're doing, obviously you've had a lot of nice connections with people and such. But I mean, coming into there, there's somebody listening in some state in this country mm -hmm. who feels like LA is, you know, out of the realm for them. They can't get here. You're here to say, I came from Australia. Yeah. You can do it. You had zero connections. You got here on day one in that first week. What did you do to get closer to the goal? That's a great question. Um, so, firstly, every step is nerve-wracking. Mm -hmm. And every single time I had a thought in that first month or year, I felt like throwing up. Yeah. It's like, should I do this? Oh, my God, this is nerve-wracking. So, I would say the first thing is you have to get over that. If you're nervous, that's the time you should step forward and work harder or try something that you think is crazy. And I, I did that constantly and I still do it. Did you have a day job or did you come here no. with some saved and you're just like, I'm going to, I got enough to survive and I'm just yeah. going to go for this. That, that was pretty much it. My yeah. wife and I put aside what we could and it cost a lot and we lost a lot of money just moving here. Yeah. But it was enough to get by for two or three months. Okay. And we thought we'll get something. That's in, not a lot it's of time. It's not a lot. Wow. No. Uh, we got down to like $200. We were that close to going back home. Uh, my wife, thank God, got some freelance work and then she got a full-time job straight after that. But- Again, it, it, that's a nerve-wracking thing. And most people would go, I'm not going to do it because that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And I said, it might happen, but let's just make sure it doesn't. And we worked so hard. And regardless of learning your art style or, or getting big on social media or, or taking tons of classes, you have to be willing to get through your nerves. Mm -hmm. um, it's the hardest thing in the world. But if, if your gut says, don't do it, probably do it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I mean just like nerve-wracking things. I'm not talking about like jumping off a cliff or, you know what I mean, but. Yeah, yeah. no, it just, it, well, it's really funny because people, people write me all the time. I've had some amazing guests on this show that even I am like, I don't know how I got <laughs> these people. And people always write to me and say, how did you get so-and-so? Mm -hmm. And my answer is, I just asked them. Yeah. Because in was I scared to? Yeah, I often was, uh -huh. especially when it's in person. And I'm just always like, you know what? What can happen? That they're going to say no. Exactly. That's the that's the literally the absolute worst that can happen is yeah. they will say no. So, is it really that big a deal? And but that's the answer. Like you get yep. those things from just sucking it up. Yeah. And uh, doing it, and like you've you've really like led by example as far as that's concerned. It's it's really insane to think. Oh, it is. You were. I was saying to you as as we're getting ready for this. It's amazing what you've done, and you said I, I feel like I should be eighty years old. <laughs> yeah. The amount of stuff I've done, and you really. I mean, you've had three careers essentially. Yeah. And uh, successful at all three, and. I don't know. Is there something in the back of your brain that's tickling around that you're like, I don't know, what's even bigger than this animation <laughs> thing for me? Uh, there's always something. Like, sometimes I want to get back to music and other things, but I think animation was always the thing that scared me most. Yeah. And it still scares me. So, that yeah. says I'm I'm not even close to finished with it. Yeah. I'm barely started. I think I'm going to be doing this for a long time. Yeah. Yeah. That's an, it, Was Disney kind of... The dream, the studio, or were you thinking, oh, I'd love to go work on Looney Tunes? Or For, for me, the, in my head, it was animation, mm -hmm. but the words that came out of my mouth, and what happened was the, the global financial crisis hit, mm -hmm. uh, the graphic design day job I had at the time, just let go everybody, and at that moment, I rang my wife and said, this happened, I'm going to work for Disney. That Instead of saying animation, yeah. that, that was the words that came out of my mouth. Probably because I'm so influenced by uh, Tyrus Wong and Fantasia. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, th that's what I said. And I still feel that way, too. But animation was the goal. It was in my head, but the word Disney came out. Yeah. And, like, it's, that still means a lot. And it's the same for anyone in animation. They all had that goal of getting the Disney feature or TV. Yeah. Yeah. It's incredible. So, you mentioned earlier you're, you're really interested in television. You want to do mm -hmm. art more so than features, even? M maybe not more so, but a as I've gotten into the industry here mm -hmm. um having worked for cartoon network and i just worked on disenchantment which came out yeah um 
I enjoyed that. And, and it's a different process each time. It's a little quicker than movies as well. So yeah. you, in a year, you get to say, hey, I'm, I've done this. Here's my work. And it's more steady. If, <laughs> if, if it gets yeah. more than one season, you know, you're... Yeah. So that's that's pretty great as well. So, yeah. uh, they they do a lot of that overseas though, don't they? The artwork for the they, it's getting that way. A yeah. lot more is going over, which is unfortunate. <laughs> They're like, we're doing it all in Australia. You're yeah. like, what? Someone joked with me once, and I said, I'm not moving again. I'm, yeah. I'm stuck here now. <laughs> yeah, man, that that's crazy. Um, do you have like a favorite Disney character or some some character that's like really kind of influenced you? Yeah, I I think every time I think about it, three pop up. Because I'm, I love Fantasia, mm-hmm. uh, I go straight to Chernobog because he scared the hell out of me and I can't get that image out Chernobog's of Chernobog's cool. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. and it's cool as hell. And I grew up on uh, horror movies. So yeah. Like, that's pretty cool to see that in a, a Disney film. Uh, I did like, I guess in my teenage years, I kind of liked the odd movie. So I liked Hercules and Emperor's New Groove. Okay. I don't wow. Know, I yeah. don't know if it was just for the character designs or Well, what, what age were you when those came out? Because like mid nineties, late nineties, wasn't that, it? That was late. I want to say like ninety six ish, something yeah, so, like so that. So I was sixteen. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I was still getting influenced by their films, and as all these different weird styles came out, again that stuck in my mind. It doesn't mean it was my favorite thing. Yeah. But those characters got stuck in my mind, and I think that's when I realized I'm starting to think too much about design and the look of things too. Yeah. Um, and then Beauty and the Beast. Like, oh yeah. Who doesn't like that film? That um, film was that was. It was so funny because that one came after Mermaid. Mm-hmm. I grew up right. I was like that golden age. I was still a kid yeah. when those came out. And I remember Mermaid and loving it. And to think that they could top that so quickly after. Actually, yeah. let me take that back. I don't think Beauty and the Beast top Mermaid. I think Mermaid's <laughs> the greatest thing ever. But for the, you know, as far as, I think money wise, it probably topped it. I think it And, did. Yeah. It, you know, it was the first animated feature ever to be nominated for an Academy Award, yeah. uh, Beauty and the Beast. So, like, it did top it in certain respects. For them to have done it so quickly after is really mind blowing. It is, yeah. Uh, I, I wonder, I think Little Mermaid was so big, even on Me Too. Yeah. That that must have given them the confidence to just go. Can we do it again? Like it had. I to. guess so, but it was so quick after. Uh, Mermaid was eighty nine. I think Beauty and the Beast was ninety one. Yeah. And so that means they were definitely working at this. You know, same t- yeah. time. Well, yeah, at least they were working on Beauty and the Beast before Mermaid was released, and they knew what they had. Yes. So I don't know. It's just. Uh, Th- that project is is crazy to me. Yeah. And did did Lion King come after that? It was Aladdin, then Lion King. Aladdin, like, so, what a run and, that was! And, and well, oh, those <laughs> four. I mean, to me, that's the ultimate. That is the Disney Animation Renaissance. It's stuck in between there. Between, I think it was between Mermaid and Beauty and the Beast was a giant flop, which was uh, the Rescuers Down Under. Oh yeah. But that really introduced the computer animation, and mm-hmm. you know I've heard numerous people say without Rescuers Down Under we wouldn't have Beauty and the Beast because of the I technology that, too, that was yeah. created. So the run, if you forget Rescuers Down Under, was Mermaid, Beauty and the Beast, Aladdin, Lion King. Yep. And that's just like. What? Yeah, like it's amazing. Is it any wonder so many people of our generation grew up wanting to be in animation? Totally. After that. Absolutely. Because I don't know what was right before Mermaid. I want if I had to guess, I'd say like Oliver and Company or something like that. Possibly, yeah. And yeah. like to go from Oliver and Company to the Little Mermaid. Yeah, some things is, change there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and you know, it was Disney must have been at a point where they're like, well, we can't fail, right? And then, yeah. <laughs> and then, like, after Lion King, I think the next one was Pocahontas, uh-huh. which was like, wah, wah. not the greatest. But being, and that's the point in my life when art was everything in animation. Yeah. So I remember watching that and I didn't even remember the story after the yeah. first time. It was just like, wow, that looked good. Yes. Yeah. And I'll give you, like, the whole Colors of the Wind sequence is a very specific oh, it's, style. Yeah. It's to it and it's beautiful and and i mean the best thing in my opinion to come out of pocahontas is the music i think the music is absolutely Ooh, yeah. incredible in yeah. that film i still can't make my way through that film very easily it's yeah. a tough one for me yeah i hear that from a few people yeah. and um it's unfortunate but 
Uh, you know which one I love? I'm curious your thoughts. Yeah, go ahead. Hunchback of Notre Dame. I love that. I'm obsessed. Because I'm like, that almost should have been a live action film for the time, yet they took a risk and made it animated. Why don't they do it now? Yeah. I mean, they're making everything live action now. Why don't they do that with Hunchback? I would oh kill. Have you seen the, the Broadway oh, version? Yeah. Don't even How get me going. <laughs> did you see it in La Jolla? Yeah, I did. Oh, my goodness. Patrick Page. Should have won a Tony Award for that. Uh-huh. I'm livid. It didn't go to Broadway for that one reason. Yeah. Him as Frollo was. I saw it in the front row. Yeah, and I just remember looking up at him singing Hellfire. Oh my god! And I was just like, I had this dumb grin on my face that yeah. entire show because I just I was blown away. It's yeah. one of my favorite theatrical experiences of my life. Yeah, me too. Now. When he did that song, yeah. if you ask my wife, she she had my arm at the time. Yeah. She felt goosebumps on yeah. me. I believe it. And I, f- I don't know what was happening, but my body felt that song. Yeah. It was weird. And that yeah, that performance from him is stunning. It might be the best performance of a song in any musical I've ever seen. Yeah, if you uh, are not familiar, listeners, of Patrick Page's performance in Hunchback and Notre Dame, the studio cast recording is available. He is on it. And, I, you know, obviously it's not the same as seeing it live, mm-hmm. but get your hands on it, listen to it. And that, that, that it saddens me tremendously that it didn't make it to Broadway. Do you know the yeah. reason behind this? No, I don't. Okay, so supposedly what I hear is, Remember the beautiful large chorus on stage? Oh, yeah. Okay. It was a big part of the show. And to take that away would definitely affect the uh, the effect that the show has on the audience. Yep. And supposedly to bring that to Broadway, every single one of those chorus members mm-hmm. would need to be equity actors. And because there are so many of them, ah. it wouldn't financially make sense. Oh, that's sad. That's the story. I don't know how true or false that is. I would love to speak to Tom Schumacher about that and really get the answer. But that's the story that I hear. And it's, you know, I really thought it was going to have like the Newsies run because it had Mm -hmm. a very similar beginning, started at a regional theater and, you know, and eventually went to Broadway and became this huge smash hit. I thought Hunchback was going to do that. Yeah, I thought so too. And it's heartbreaking. Maybe one day it'll do it. I really hope so. And like, if the reason is because of that affordability issue. I kind of just feel like Disney, you can afford it. Let's just do a six month limited yeah. run or something. <laughs> let's let's get him that Tony Award. That I don't know. It was, it was incredible. Yeah, absolutely incredible. I love that you loved that as well because I wasn't sure if you were a theater guy. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I grew up on it. Okay. Um, my grandmother took me to shows all the time. First one was Jesus Christ Superstar. Okay. Yeah. So I remember them all. Yeah. That's awesome. Anyway, anything else you want to add before we wrap things up here? You've had quite an interesting career and uh, hopefully some, somebody listening to, listening to this is inspired to just like, you know, move across, like move to a different country <laughs> or whatever you have, that dream is. Just take that leap of faith and do it because yeah. uh, I think that's really the lesson to be learned in this interview here and uh yeah anything you want to add before we go yeah i mean just if if someone is interested in animation interested in working for disney whatever it is and if it makes you nervous when i'm saying this and you're thinking about it it's the right thing and just try it worst thing that happens is you're back at square one that that you're at now yeah that's it and and like you said before email people ask questions take courses uh ask floyd norman to (laughs) dinner like lauren did like do something crazy and the worst that is going to happen is someone will say no to you. And here's something I've learned just in life is people are way nicer than oh yeah than we think. <laughs> like there are a lot of jerks out there, but like people are really willing to help if they've been successful. I find because yeah. we've all been in that spot of like knowing nobody. And mm-hmm. I mean, I moved out here knowing not a single soul as well. Yeah. So it's uh terrifying and risky do it as young as you can that's because helpful <laughs> naivete is the greatest gift given to oh, yeah. every human uh it's the greatest thing so. yeah if, you, if you're in your 20s go do something yes do something crazy <laughs> absolutely before the babies before the the marriage if, if you can do that as well but with that said i didn't do any of this until i was 34 for the animation stuff yeah. when did the wrestling start Wrestling was 23. 23. And then, that was probably craziest. So that was my crazy period. <laughs> that was your crazy period. I love it. Anyway, once again, guys, you can go to nickgregory.com. That's N-I-C-G-R-E-G-O-R-Y.com to learn more about this guy. Is there a contact page on there as well? There is. Everything's on there. So there you go. We just said 
send that email, reach out to that person, yep. ask that question, inundate this man's <laughs> inbox. And Nick, thank you so much for coming on the show. It was an absolute pleasure. Thank you. And before we get going, folks, I want to remind all of you that all of our social media can be found over at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. Make sure you're following us on Twitter to take part in the Twitter poll every single week, which is featured on the Sunday episode of Disney Coast to Coast. And over on Instagram, the Daily Disney Decision happens every single day, so make sure you're following D-I-Z-N-E-Y-C-T-C on both of those. As I mentioned, you can find the links over at DisneyCoastToCoast.com. Other than that, folks, have a magical week. Bye! Thanks for watching Disney Coast to Coast. Have a magical day. <laughs> Disney Coast to Coast is produced and hosted by Jeff DePauly. Learn more about the podcast and become a supporter at DisneyCoastToCoast.com.